So welcome to today's lecture on terrorism. Um, so terrorism is always a little bit of a, a difficult topic to talk about um, because it's one that's quite politically sensitive for a lot of people. It gets a lot of emotions, um, you know, from you know, just about uh, you know, everyone. Um, so I want to be really careful today in noting um, that what we're not going to be talking about is how, you know, terrorism is um, awful or immoral or, um, you know, people who do it are, are crazy. Um, you know, we can make a moral judgment that uh, terrorism is bad. We could also make a moral judgment that war and uh, civil war and pretty much any form of political violence is bad. Um, but like all those other topics, when we talk about them, we stack, but we stuck more to you know, the facts and understanding why it happens. Um, and in all these cases, if we actually want political violence to go away, our best tool in doing so is to actually understand why does it happen? You know, why do wars happen? Why do civil wars happen? And why do people choose terrorism? Why, why does terrorism happen? So that can be more of the focus of the lecture today. All right, so what is terrorism? Um, so terrorism involves the use of violence by an organization other than a national government to cause intimidation or fear among a target audience. So this use of violence can be actively using violence, but it also can involve the threat of use of violence. Um, so as long as that threat causes fear or intimidation. Um, it can be any organization other than national government. So while states may do take actions that you know, in many ways resemble those of a terrorist organization that wouldn't be uh, considered terrorism um, according to, you know, most definitions. Uh, the goal is to cause intimidation or fear. Uh, so it's to gain a, an emotional response. So usually in terrorism, the, you know, it, say it's an, an explosion. Um, the prize in the action isn't blowing up whatever you're blowing up. It's the result of the explosions, right? So it's how people react to the explosion. So if, if, for example, if a bus is blown up, it's not that that bus had any value in and of itself. Its value is that it causes intimidation and fear among whoever the target audience would be. Um, and so terrorism has two main pur purposes, to gain supporters and to coerce opponents. So in many cases, uh, terrorists um, are actually hoping to do a little bit of both often aiming to, you know, um, both to coerce the target audience, uh, to get them to change some of their behavior, um, but also at the same time to signal to supporters um, to join the organization. Um, but as we're going to look at the type of terrorism, uh, types of terrorism, uh, different terrorist organizations often have to make a difficult choice when they're trying to balance uh, coercion and gaining supporters, right? Increasing coercion can make it less likely to gain supporters. Um, trying to get more supporters can sometimes make the action less coercive. So the first type of terrorist, uh, terrorism is demonstrative terrorism. And so this is directed mainly at publicity. So on the terms of uh, gaining uh, recruits or gaining uh, supporters, um, this will be the one that for, uh, furthest on that side uh, for any or all of three reasons. So gaining publicity to recruit more activists, to gain attention to grievances from soft liners on the other side, and to gain attention from third parties who might be uh, pressure on the other side, right? So why might you want to gain publicity, right? Uh, so any organization, uh, if it wants to be successful, requires recruits. And so gaining more activists is important uh, so that you can have increased capacity to carry out attacks, to lobby governments, or uh, to raise funds. Um, all of these things, you, you require members of your organization, uh, different skill sets. Well, uh, to gain attention for grievances from softliners on the other side. Uh, oftentimes, you know, there may be people who uh, don't necessarily agree with you or who aren't on your side. Um, but they may be uh, they may be sympathetic to whatever grievance you have. Terrorism's in response to some grievance, uh, just like most of the other uh, uh, violent actors we've looked at. It occurs because there's some form of grievance. Um, and while members of the other side may not fully agree with you, 
they may be sympathetic to some elements of your argument. And so you can, if you're not overly violent, you may be able to gain some sympathy from others on the other side. And then gain attention from third parties who might exert pressure on the other side, right? So maybe it might be a sympathetic, a people are sympathetic outside of your country. It may be like other states who might be allies. It may be uh, people in uh, another target state. So say you're targeting a foreign state, you may be able to gain uh, sympathetic voices from uh, allies of that state or from members of the population of that state, uh, and they may be able to place, exert pressure on the other side. Um, so in demonstrative terrorism, we often see hostage taking, airline hijacking, and explosions announced in advance. Uh, and so these are more on the threat of harm side, the possibility of causing harm, and it brings attention to, uh, to the target audience. Uh, in these cases, terrorism often avoids serious harm as not to undermine sympathy for the political cause. If you're overly violent, if you uh, kill too many people, uh, most people, particularly when we're talking about softliners from the other side and third parties, aren't going to be as sympathetic to your cause. Um, but if you don't actually hurt people, if it's just a, a threat, um, more of a, a publicity action, then you can gain, you haven't uh, alienated as many people. Um, the second form is destructive terrorism. Um, is more aggressive than demonstrative terrorism, so seeking to coerce opponents as well as mobilize support for the cause. Destructive terrorists seek to inflict real harm on members of the target audience at the risk of losing sympathy for their cause. Exactly how groups strike the balance between harm and uh, sympathy depends on the nature of the political goal. Right, so in this case, um, you know, demonstrative terrorism is really good at gaining sympathy. It does, it's not nearly as powerful as, um, as a course of tool um, because it doesn't put as much pressure on the target audience. Uh, people, um, you know, if there's a bombing that's announced in advance, people aren't as scared. And if people aren't as scared, they're not gonna put as much pressure necessarily on their government. Um, so destructive terrorism is seeking to increase the violence. Uh, is uh, seeking to increase the damage to have an increase in coercion. It does mean though with every increase in violence that you're going to lose some support. It may be harder to mobilize support even within your own group. If you get too violent, people may say that you know the actions cross the line. Um, it's definitely going to be much more difficult to gain support of softliners to your grievance, people who may have been sympathetic to your argument, um, but they're probably not going to be able to side with you openly um, because they can't support um, your actions. And third party, similarly, if you go too far, um, it's more difficult to gain support. So with the increase in coercion, there is the risk of losing uh, public support. And then finally, suicide terrorism is the most aggressive form of terrorism, uh, pursuing coercion, even at the expense of losing support among the terrorist's own community. What distinguishes a suicide terrorism is that the attacker does not expect to survive a mission and often employs a method of attack that requires the attacker's death in order to succeed, such as uh, planting a car bomb, wearing a suicide vest, or ramming an airplane into a building. In essence, a suicide terrorist uh, kills others at the same time that he or, or she kills um, him or herself. herself. Um, so this is much higher in forms of coercion. Uh, in terms of causing fear in a target population, um, suicide terrorism, uh, it's much more effective. At the same time, it definitely sacrifices a lot of support. It will uh, definitely go too far for softliners um, on the other side. Um, it'll go too far for most third parties. And you're gonna alienate a lot of even members of your own community um, who view um, either the violence as crossing a line, um, that level of destructiveness, or the fact that you're killing yourself, the, the suicide component uh, will alienate uh, some members of your own community too. Uh, and so uh, this one is definitely the most coercive, um, but um, have the lowest, say, in terms of gaining support. Um, it will attract support from certain segments. So some of the most extremist elements will be attracted to groups that are willing to um, commit uh, suicide terrorist attacks. Um, but most uh, 
the average member of most communities will view this as a step too far. So in principle, suicide terrorists could be used for demonstrative uh, purposes or could be limited to target and assassination, right? So suicide terrorism doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the destructiveness is going to be super high, right? So I could, if I want to, you know, wear a suicide vest, um, I could tell the authorities in advance that I'm planning to blow myself up. The area could be cleared and uh, the only person killed would be myself. It would be a purely, you know, symbolic matter. Um, or it could be targeted assassinations. So there's someone, uh, you know, a government leader, a symbolic leader, um, who we want to take out, it's still destructive and that it kills that person, but it's not seeking a high body count. It's really just uh, seeking to take out certain targeted people. But in practice, suicide terrorists often seek to simply to kill the largest number of people, um, which makes it more coercive, but it does the greatest harm to um, support or raising support. Uh, yeah, so maximizes the number of randomly killed, uh, also maximizes the alienation of those who may have been sympathetic to the cause. Uh, and suicide creates a debate and often loss of support among more moderate segments of the terrorist own community. Um, thus, while uh, coercion is an element in all terrorism, coercion is the paramount objective of suicide terrorism, generally, in the way that it's applied. Again, it, it does, it could be largely actually um, symbolic or demonstrative, um, but the way it's applied, it tends to be the highest in coercion, highest in destructiveness. So we kind of have a continuum between demonstrative, which is lowest in coercion, highest in uh, signaling to the public, or in terms of or gaining support from, the, uh, uh, from target audiences. Um, destructive is in the middle, and then suicide is at the other end of the spectrum. So suicide terrorism in general has been increasing in frequency as a tactic. So from 1983 to 2001, uh, so it's a bit, little bit dated, but there were 188 suicide attacks, only 31 in the 1980s, 104 in the 1990s, and 53 in 2000, 2001 alone. So it's definitely something that um, has been growing in impact. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, why that might be. Um, terrorism overall and as a pattern uh, or as a, an action was decreasing in frequency until about 2004, right? So there's a lot uh, in the 1980s, and then it uh, we're starting in the 1970s, 1980s, which is quite a bit, and then it was decreasing throughout the 90s overall. So as suicide terrorism is going up in, in popularity, uh, generally terrorism overall was, was going down. Um, we did see a uh, uptick or an increase in frequency beginning in 2005 and a major increase around 2011, um, around the time of the uh, Arab Spring coming uh, about and uh, the rise of ISIS. We saw major upticks uh, would, would fit around the uh, major increase around 2011. There was a record high um, around 2014 and it's been decreasing quite steadily since at a fairly rapid rate. It's still relatively high compared to historical um, averages, um, but it has been declining uh, since. So suicide terrorism is more deadly. Um, so from 1980 to 2001, 3% of all terrorist attacks involved suicide attacks. Um, so a tiny portion of uh, all terrorist attacks were suicide, um, but 40%, 48%, so nearly half of all deaths from terrorist attacks were from suicide attacks, and that's excluding September 11th. September 11th was by far in that time period uh, the most deadly, um, and so even without September 11th, nearly half of deaths from terrorist attacks were from suicide attacks. So at least in that time period, we're seeing that it was far more deadly, and that fits with its coercive nature, how we said in, in practice it tends to seek to maximize uh, its coercive potential. Um, so many of these other ones, uh, the 97%, they've been more just, uh, you know, demonstrative, particularly earlier, you saw a lot of demonstrative hijacking and stuff like that. Uh, we would have had to share of destructive, uh, but not necessarily as destructive. 
and then at the uh, suicide terrorism being by far the most destructive. So suicide terrorism um, and terrorism in general has typically been viewed as a religion thing uh, or a religion problem. Um, so, you know, religious matter, but in, in reality, that's not the case. Religious motives may matter, but modern suicide terrorism is not limited to Islamic fundamentalism, Islamic. Uh, so Islamic groups receive the most attention in Western media, uh, but the world's leader in suicide terrorism is actually the uh, Liberation Tigers of Tama uh, Ilam, um, a group uh, who recruits from predominantly Hindu Tamil population in northern and eastern Sri Lanka, and whose ideology has Marxist Leninist elements. Uh, the Tamil Tigers alone accounts for 75 of the 186 suicide terrorist attacks from 1980 to 2001. Um, so there may be some change um, since then, but the point more is to show that it's not just, uh, you know, suicide terrorism and terrorism in general can have all forms of motivation. Um, it's not necessarily related. Many of those motivations aren't related to religion. And even when it may be related to religion, we have um, terrorists and suicide terrorists from many, many, many different religious backgrounds. Um, so we hear a lot about um, you know, uh, fundamentals, um, Related to kind of like Islamic fundamentalism, um, but that's largely because of targets and uh, you know how we frame terrorism in North America. Um, but that's only one portion of you know all terrorism. It's not a poor person problem. So generally speaking. Um, we tended to have this profile of suicide terrorists um, as uneducated, unemployed, socially isolated single men in their late teens and early 20s. So people didn't really have any other option, and so they're kind of lured into the idea of suicide uh, terrorism. Um, often, you know, for the idea of payment for their families or something like that. Um, but suicide terrorists. Um, is a lot more complex uh, than we originally thought in terms of uh, the demographic and psychological background. Um, so research has actually showed that suicide terrorists can be college educated or undereducated, married or single, men or women, socially in isolated or integrated from age 13 to age 47. Um, so while um, only very few people actually become suicide terrorists in, in, in based on the global population, it's a tiny proportion. They come from a broad cross-section of lifestyles. And so one of the problems that we found in trying to stop suicide terrorism um, is that um, identifying, figuring out how to identify potential suicide terrorists in advance has proved to be um, extremely difficult. Um, there doesn't seem to be a, a strict profile in terms of any of these demographic characteristics or even largely in terms of psychological characteristics. The only unifying thing that um, within many terrorist organizations is attachment to the grievance. And that grievance can span across multiple different uh, characteristics. Suicide terrorism is strategic. Um, so even if many suicide attackers are irrational or fanatical, the leadership groups that recruit and direct them are not. Viewed from the perspective of the terrorist organization, suicide attacks are designed to achieve specific political purposes. And these purposes are to coerce a target government to change policy, to mobilize additional recruits, and, uh, and financial support, or both. Right? So the typical view on suicide terrorism, and also on terrorism in general, is that it's this irrational action um, without real purpose, without any prospects of success. Um, and so these are crazy people. Um, but it turns out when we look at uh, suicide terrorism or when we look at terrorist campaigns or organizations, um, they have very, um, they're carrying out these attacks for very clear and specified political purposes, right? And they've selected this as what they believe to be the best method to achieve the uh, change that they want to. Uh, uh, they want to have happen. 
Um, and so this is a calculated decision, not a rational decision. And, and that's important to understand if you want to stop suicide terrorism or stop terrorism in general. Um, if it's you know a, a, just a bunch of crazy people, you have to select certain methods for stopping it. Um, if it's something that's calculated, if it's you know um, if the groups are weighing different policy options, and this is the policy option that they believe is calculated to you not know, the highest likelihood of success, then the options that we need to select to stop it um, are different. Right, we need to either you know minimize the likelihood that it leads to success, or we need to address whatever concerns are leading to you know um, people selecting this option. So, uh, in essence, suicide terrorism is an extreme form of what Thomas Schelling referred to as uh, the rationality of the irrationality, which an act that is irrational for an individual attacker is meant to demonstrate credibility. With democratic audience that still more and greater attacks are sure to come. As such, modern suicide terrorism is analogous to instances of international coercion. We'll come back to this. Um, for states, air power and economic sanctions are often the preferred coercive tools. Uh, for terrorist groups, suicide attacks are becoming the coercive instrument um, of choice. Right? So um, suicide terrorism is selected as this ultimate means of uh, for these groups of communicating their intent that they not only have brought pain um, but also that they're capable of doing it more and if you're trying to provoke fear in an audience showing that you're there's no line that you're um, not willing to cross that you have the capacity to be able to carry out attacks and that uh, that therefore, when you say more is likely to come unless you change what you're doing, that's likely to provoke a lot of fear in people because um, it's a credible threat that you're willing and able to carry out what you're doing. Um, and so uh, this makes it, can make it a very effective uh, tactic. So let's look at a little bit more at terrorism as coercion. So suicide terrorism and terrorism in general occurs under the reverse structural conditions. So normally the coercer is often the stronger party. Um, but in, in the case of terrorism, the coercer is actually the weaker party because terrorists are generally um, competing against um, states. And as powerful as a terrorist organization may be, they're um, weaker than um, nation states, often vastly weaker than uh, the uh, nation states that they're, they're targeting. Um, so while some elements of the coercive situation remain the same, flipping the stronger and weaker sides in the course of this dispute has a dramatic change on the uh, relative feasibility of punishment and denial. Um, so when you're talking about coercion uh, or coercing someone else, um, you have a couple of options for being how to coerce them. Uh, you can uh, threaten punishment, that if they do something you don't want, you will punish them, or you can deny uh, so you can deny them the ability to achieve whatever the goal they want. So essentially tell them, you know, you may want to do this thing, but you're unable to. So for example, um, the way to coerce someone not to invade you is to have a really strong defense. And in this case, you can tell them, if you try to invade me, my army is stronger than yours, you will not succeed. Um, and so that's denial. The other form would be punishment saying, you may be strong enough to overwhelm my, you know, border forces, but I will be able to punish you with, you know, missile strikes or all, uh, or uh, bomber strikes or um, stuff like that, and that will cause too high of cost, and so you should not do this. Um, in the case of the terrorism, um, because um, the coercer is actually the weaker actor, uh, denial is impossible. Uh, a terrorist organization can't deny a state really the ability to do anything. Um, they just don't really have that strength. Um, so the only um, opportunity left then is punishment. So the element of suicide is novel, right? 
So that's a relative one. Uh, it's actually existed for a long time, but it's relatively novel um, in terms of it, it's certainly gained in provenance over the last decades. Uh, and the pain inflicted on civilians is often sp spectacular and gruesome. Um, the heart of the strategy of suicide terrorism is the same as the coercive logic used by states when they employ air power or economic sanctions to punish an adversary. To cause mounting civilian costs to overwhelm the target state's interest in issue and dispute, and so to cause it to concede to terrorist political demand. Right, so while the actions carried out may look very different, right, um, particularly in how um, as we've written spectacular and gruesome suicide terrorism can be. The, um, in terms of kind of the tactic, um, it does in many ways resemble uh, air power. So, you know, bombings and economic sanctions, um, you know, strategies that punish an adversary. It puts mounting and mounting and mounting civilian costs on the government. And so it either makes it so that the government itself decides this is too costly or the civilian population forces the government to decide that this is too costly. Uh, and so then the government must change it, its actions. Um, so it creates a course of leverage. It's not so much actual damage as the expectation of future damage, right? So the, the damage itself that's caused by suicide terrorism and often other with, you know, only a few other examples, often air power and economic sanctions, the costs themselves are bad, um, but the costs themselves usually won't overwhelm the state itself. The, the, the real problem is that uh, the population believes that this is going to continue and could continue for a really long time, and that the costs over the long term may be unbearable. Um, so let's look more specifically at how suicide terrorism co uh, coercive. Um, so suicide terrorist uh, attacks are more destructive than other terrorist attacks. So uh, the punishment um, is stronger or is higher. Uh, suicide attacks are an especially convincing way to signal the likelihood of more pain to come. Um, again, because how we talked about um, its credibility um, and just its um, how spectacular it is, so how much attention it gets. Um, it's a very good signal or sorry, effective signal that more is likely to come. So the population during a suicide terrorist campaign really is likely to believe that, you know, that this isn't done, that this group is going to continue doing this until it gets what it wants. Um, so suicide terrorist organizations are better positioned than other terrorists to increase expectations about es escalating future costs by deliberately violating norms in the use of violence. And so this is where um, suicide terrorism really is more effective than other forms of terrorism, even at the coercive side. Um, it's not just the destructiveness that gets people believing that there's more. It's that this, the, by choosing suicide terrorism, both with its destructiveness, but also with the suicide component, um, so many norms about violence, but just in general, societal norms have been violated by the group um, that in terms of convincing the public that this group is willing to do anything and won't stop until um, its desires are met, um, suicide terrorists are, are far more effective um, and far more coercive um, in, in, or far more, uh, yeah, far more effective in uh, convincing population that more pain is likely to come and therefore being uh, more likely to cause fear uh, and intimidation among the public. And you know, that's the goal, uh, or one of the primary goals of terror, remember, is to cause fear and intimidation among the public so that they can exploit that, um, the course of government into changing its actions. Um, so returning to suicide terrorism strategic, um, Suicide terrorism is organized in campaigns. Um, the vast majority of suicide terrorist attacks are not isolated or random acts by individual fanatics, but rather occur in clusters as part of a larger campaign by an organized group to achieve specific political goals. So a group has a spe spe specific set of goals and they evaluate 
what are their available options and they choose that suicide terrorism they believe is the most effective action to uh, achieve their goals. So if they had other better options, uh, if we uh, assume that they're strategic, then we should also assume that they would choose them. And so that's again where it's important to see, uh, look at the cause of terrorism and seeing that oftentimes suicide terrorism campaigns are strategic uh, and that many of the actors choosing it are rational. Um, because if they're all just crazy, then you know, giving them other means of addressing their grievances isn't likely to be effective, right? Because we can't trust that they're going to do a cost-benefit analysis and see, okay, you know, this is more likely to achieve our goals and it has a much lower cost, so let's, let's choose this. Um, but if we view them as strategic and giving them alternative ways, lower cost ways um, to address their grievances, would uh, lead to you know these groups um these political groups choosing another tactic um, because it's important oftentimes we label groups as terrorist groups um and i, I find that to be a very misleading name um it's groups that choose terrorism but many times the group doesn't only choose terrorism um but also it um it masks often the political goals that it's this is the political organization um, that's organized around specific purpose that has evaluated what tactics are available to them what uh, opportunities are available to them what uh, means do they have at their disposal and it's chosen that terrorism is likely to be the most effective strategy um, so it's a tactical choice by a political group um, so groups using uh, suicide terrorism consistent, uh, consistently announce specific political goals and stop uh, suicide attacks when those goals have been fully or partially achieved, right? So it's clear what the goals are of a group and if they achieve them, the campaign ends. So the suicide terrorism really is about the political goals. Self-determination um, is one of the most frequent goals for suicide terrorism and democracies are the most frequent targets. So the strategic logic of suicide terrorism is specifically designed to coerce modern democracies to make significant concessions to national self-determination. In general, suicide terrorist campaigns seek to achieve specific territorial goals, most often withdrawal of target states military forces from what the uh, terrorists see as national homeland. So why democracies? Um, well, if you're trying to use fear and intimidation of the public to coerce a state into changing its actions. Um, that's far more likely to happen if the state is responsive to the public. Um, if the state's not responsive to the public um, because the state um, survival, the government survival doesn't rely on the public, then it doesn't really matter if the public is fear, uh, fearful or intimidated. Um, if the government survival requires the support of the people and the people are unhappy, the people are scared, then the government has two choices. Either it's likely to lose power because the, the population is dissatisfied or it needs to take actions to stop uh, the terrorist organization. So that could be trying to challenge them, trying to fight them. But that also could be in terms of addressing the grievances and getting them to stop the campaign because they reached some of their goals. Um, and so just non-democratic governments don't have to be as responsive as uh, democratic ones. And uh, yeah, uh, self-determination, so gaining um, control over territory, oftentimes with the withdrawal of foreign military forces is from the that would perceive as the national homeland is the most common uh, goal. So from 1980 to 2001, the main goal of every suicide terrorist campaign has been self-determination. Uh, and from 1980 to 2001, every suicide terrorist campaign has targeted democracy, right? So at least in this time period, it, it seems pretty clear that um, using so again we said 
suicide terrorist is, it's a tactic used by or strategy used by um, a political group to achieve a goal. A goal is almost always self-determination. Uh, and we said it's strategic and right. So they're only going to choose it if it has a, you know, a probability or a decent probability of success. Um, and it has a higher probability of succeeding against democracies. And that's why they're targeting democracies. And uh, strategic terrorism works, right? So in the kind of the, again, 1980 to 2000, two type range, uh, suicide terrorism has steadily risen because terrorists have learned that it pays, that it works. Uh, terrorist groups did not achieve their full objectives in all cases in that 20 year period. However, in all but the, uh, the case of Turkey, the uh, terrorist political cause made more gains after the resort to suicide operations than it had before. Least of terrorist groups have consistently credited suicide operations as contributing to these gains. The assessments are hardly unreasonable given the timing and circumstance of many of the concessions, right? So the suicide terrorism campaign, nothing was happening. The suicide terrorism campaign begins and then they gain concessions. It seems reasonable to assume that uh, the concessions are caused by the suicide the terrorism campaign. Uh, uh, yeah, and many people, it's not just the terrorist organization that do this, but academics, national government leaders, and the public tend to credit a terrorist campaign. Um, it's important to know, though, that it produces moderate concessions, right? You're not going to get a state to give up on uh, any core uh, interest, right? Uh, but if something is of moderate importance to a state, then it's easy for the costs to overwhelm their commitment to that specific issue. Now, if it's a core, you know, like a piece of land within the territory, a particularly one of it's valuable, or if it's given up control over, you know, a state, that's pretty core to the state's interest. Um, and so you're, not, you're never gonna get the, that level of cost from by terrorism. With something that's of secondary importance to a state, uh, you may be able to make the, you know, the punishment, the cost, high enough that the state's willing to give it up. So in general, suicide terrorism relies on the threat to inflict low to medium levels of punishment on civilians. Uh, in other circumstances, this level of punishment has rarely caused uh, modern nation states to surrender significant political goals, partly because modern nation states are often willing to count its high costs for high interest, and partly because modern nation states are often able to mitigate civilian costs by making economic and other adjustments, right? So if it's a core interest, the state's going to be able to either adjust or just sustain the high costs. But at lower levels of demands, that's not the case. So suicide terrorism may marginally increase the punishment that is inflicted and so make it, uh, target nations somewhat more likely to surrender modest goals. Um, but it's not going to get them to give up on important goals. Um, National governments have, in fact, responded aggressively to ambitious suicide terrorist campaigns in recent years. Um, so if you, the, the suicide terrorist group pushes too hard on a core interest area, you can have the government cracking down hard on it um, because they still have to try to stop it. Um, but rather than giving a concession, the method used will often be to try to combat it, to try to stop it militarily uh, or through intelligence or police forces. Um, de depending on the case, um, or to form some form of adjustment that would deny them access to, to the territory, tightening border security, tightening police force, um, whatever it is, um, because they can't stop the group through negotiation. They can hopefully try to stop it by um, destroying it or denying its capacity to cause punishment. Um, so PAPE concludes with preventing suicide terrorism. The most promising way to contain suicide terrorism is to reduce terrorist confidence in their ability to carry out such attacks on the target society. States that face persistent suicide terrorism should recognize that neither offensive military action nor concessions alone are likely to do much good and should invest significant resources in border defense and other means of homeland security. Um, and this is somewhere where actually I put the PAPE's conclusion here because we've relied a lot on his analysis. But somewhere where um, I actually disagree a lot um, with him. And I still put it because 
um, it's important to see that even when you know we're looking at these situations you can you know share you can agree on what the situation is and then come to different conclusions about what should be done uh, and that's just normal in, in the kind of the policy discussion um, area um, and and the reason that I disagree in the idea that um, relying on uh, homeland security or border defenses it's just it, it's a practical one in the sense that in most cases particularly when we're dealing with so, uh, the sizes of many modern uh, democracies um, and particularly the case of the United States um, or, or Canada um, where the states are just so large um, it's you know it, it's almost impossible to get to the level of border defenses and uh, homeland security that's going to deny um, the ability of terrorist organizations to cause punishment to impose costs on the society um, and the only measures that you could take that could really make it so that you could not universally but consistently deny um, would be to be you know have such restrictive security measures uh, that you're closing the society in a way that makes it almost unrecognizable um, to the open societies that we're trying to make um, democracies. Um, so I think that, you know, if we look at, so the idea of denying ter terrorist organizations um, from a, if we assume that they're strategic makes sense. Um, if the likelihood that they can succeed um, is low, if the costs of them are high because a lot of their attacks are thwarted, then you hope that they will calculate that this is too costly of an action and will choose something else. Uh, and so that makes sense. But from a practical purpose, um, for the state, if the state's looking at rationally, this seems like also an extremely costly, not just in terms of resources, but also in terms of societal sacrifices. Um, that I think there's other actions um, that are more likely to bear fruit, right? So it may now in certain cases, right, when we're dealing with core interest, concessions aren't likely to work necessarily. Um, so the better, I think, conclusion from the analysis is that the best way to combat suicide terrorism, uh, terrorism in general, is to give an alternative uh, pathway for the groups to express their grievances. Um, when uh, that uh, is less violent, so less costly on the group, um, and that has equal or higher likelihood of being effective. Um, so if we give terrorist organizations a, uh, there's often been this debate about, you know, um, can a terrorist organization become a political party? Uh, and there's those who say, look, based on the things they've done, they're a terrorist organization, we need to, uh, you know, blacklist them. Um, uh, and, and to a certain extent, that makes sense, right? Because their actions are things that society considers criminal. Um, and so we shouldn't be rewarding that. Uh, on the flip side, the very reason they're choosing these actions are because of um, the belief that A, they work, but B, that there's not a possibility of achieving their goals through other means, right? This is C, they choose this action because it's the most likely to work and it's the highest probability of success um, compared to the cost. Um, if you give them a, a lower cost uh, alternative through an engagement in the regular political process, uh, you may be, this may be a more likely way of uh, minimizing future terrorist attacks. Now, how exactly you do this, right? Like we can't just necessarily, you know, sign up all terrorist organizations and say, hey, come join the political process, the political party and, you know, run for parliament or Congress, particularly when you're dealing with forced terror foreign terrorist organizations, right? Like the United States is not going to let a, you know, group of non-Americans run for political office in, in Congress. Right, that's never going to happen. Um, but we have to figure out, you know, what is the way that we can give these political organizations 
um, other options. And that seems based on the, the, the calculation that, or based on the belief that uh, suicide terrorism and terrorism is a strategic choice, right? It's chosen um, based on rough, rational calculations. Um, this seems like the most logical conclusion. And then I, I just want to conclude with one slide on the level of threat. Um, because there's something interesting with terrorism, uh, particularly after 2001, we saw a massive change in our entire security discourse, right? Like um, completely new government organizations were created, massive sums were uh, spent on homeland security. The very nature of air travel was changed fundamentally. The like security procedures from pre-9-11 to post-9-11 are, are, are night and day. Uh, I know many of the students are, that now are far too young and wouldn't remember anything pre-9-11, but you know, before 9-11, uh, I can remember going up to, you know, just if I was greeting somebody who was, you know, uh, flying to Montreal, or if I was seeing someone off who was leaving Montreal, his family was flying back home, we could walk them right to the gate. Uh, and, you know, that's not something that uh, you can do anymore. Um, and, you know, terrorism also just seems so, it's, we, we've spent massive sums on terrorism. It also just seems, if you ask in public opinion polls constantly, if you ask people since 2001, you know, what are the biggest security threats in the world? Terrorism always scores incredibly high. Um, and government officials throughout the 2000s were telling us, you know, it's, it's not uh, a question if there'll be another terrorist attack, it's a question of when it will be. Um, so it's reasonable given the, you know, the fear that we have of it, the, the belief that this is a high probable event uh, and the massive sums that we've spent on it to ask what is the level of threat? Um, and I think a reasonable answer is, I mean, it's a real threat. And we've certainly throughout the you know, 2010s seen an uptick, um, particularly in terms of in, in Western countries um, of you know, the use of lone wolf using uh, vehicles or um, knives or guns and just entering um, you know public squares and and or public venues and and using those um, so less complex and organized massive scale ones um, but st still could be very damaging so we've seen an, an uptick on, on that um, but still the probability I think is is uh, something that we need to take seriously uh, and it's often overstated, right? And, and so um, uh, Mueller pu uh, puts out uh, um, this, this quote, uh, uh, John Mueller puts out this quote, um, that it, if it's so easy to pull off an attack and if terrorists are so demonically confident, right? Like, and that's what kind of the, uh, the frame that was um, presented to us in the 2000s, right? It's easy for terrorists to pull off an attack, particularly a simple one. And these guys are just so demonically confident that they, they can both succeed at whatever they do. Why have they not? Why have they not done it? Why have there not been more attacks? Why have they not been sniping at people in shopping centers, collapsing tunnels, poisoning the food supply, cutting electrical lines, derailing trains, blowing up oil pipelines, causing massive tra uh, traffic jams, or exploiting the countless other vulnerabilities that, according to security experts, could so easily be exploited. When we live in an open society like most democracies, right, there's just so many security exploits that could be, uh, um, that could, uh, or security vulnerabilities that could be exploited, right? We live in open societies. It's, there's so many possible weapons that could be used to attack people. Um, there's so many areas that you could attack them. Um, and so one reasonable explanation is that no terrorist exists in the United States uh, and few have the means uh, or the inclination to strike from abroad. Uh, so almost no terrorist exists in the United States. Uh, and so this was written for the United States. So it's not to say that, so um, it's not a, ca a case that would mean that there's nearly as many terrorists with fear that there's massive cells spread throughout the United States. Um, and, you know, maybe that's just not the case. And Maybe, and there's also the, the fear that so many would come from abroad, but maybe they just either don't have the means or the inclinations to strike from abroad. 
Um, but this explanation is rarely offered. We still tend to stick to terrorists can attack whenever uh, they want. Um, and what seems to be the far larger threat, which is increasingly getting attention now because of the way in, in the 2010s that terrorism has changed, but you know, early after 2001 didn't get as nearly as much attention, is that lone wolf terrorist, one who's been radicalized, you know, someone who lives in, you know, it, from the Canadian perspective, somebody who lives in Canada, radicalized on the internet, um, seeing things, you know, videos or going on websites, and, and they become radicalized to a specific cause on the internet and then carry out an attack um, on behalf of a group while not really being formally part of the group. Kind of a lone wolf, or it's not um, an Al Qaeda planned attack. It's someone who may have seen Al Qaeda type messaging or ISIS type messaging and became, become sympathetic to the group, but they may not have had any contact with any leadership or uh, even any rank and file member of the group. They just do it. Um, of their own accord. Um, that's more concerning because in terms of how do you track this down, how do you prevent it, that's very difficult. But even then, it's something that we don't want to oversell. Uh, we haven't seen a flood of lone wolf terrorism uh, neither. We've certainly seen many, in several cases, um, but it's not like um, we've seen a flood of it. Um, so. Again, the goal for today's class was to try to look at, you know, what are the causes of terrorism? Why is it that uh, terrorism occurs? And we put a particular focus on suicide terrorism. Um, and we did so, so that we could, you know, hopefully um, try to uh, stop it. We, one of the goals of trying to explain interstate wars or explain civil wars is that if we understand the cause, we can um, prevent them from happening. Similarly, if we can figure out why is it that people are choosing terrorist uh, terrorism, then we can stop people from doing it. We can stop people from demanding terrorism, right? Or we can stop people from joining up with terrorist organizations. Even if there's groups that say we want to do terrorism, we can stop people from wanting to join. Um, and so the goal here is to try to take a look at, you know, what are the reasons why is it that people choose terrorism? Um, why do they select this strategy, um, and uh, and you know why does it work? What are they actually doing with it? All right. So next class, we're going to start talking about trade. So a bit of a transition out of the security realm into and the start of looking at political economy. Um, have a great day.